two on, Ruth. Okay. I think somebody's there. When you're ready, let us know. We'll start. Good morning. Welcome to Central Sabbath School class. Good, Good to have you all here. It's been an interesting morning with microphones not working and stuff, but we're getting started. I would like to open the floor for prayer and praise requests. We have microphones on each pew. Uh, last week, uh, Ruth and I enjoyed Sabbath School on YouTube and learned how important it was for you to use microphones. So if you have something to say, please pass a mic. <laughs> Um, yeah, just keep it in your lap and hand it to whoever's talking. And welcome to all the people that are worshiping with us online. We're glad you're here. And a special shout out to Roxy, my sister-in-law. I hope you're having a good Sabbath. And Fred. And Fred. Yes, Roxy <laughs> and Fred. And David and Grace uh, will be remembering you guys in prayer this morning in a special way. And if you would like us to mention a prayer request or if you have a comment about the class and you're watching online, please feel free to email us at media at spokaneadventist.org. That's media at spokaneadventist.org. So we have some guests with us who feel like family. <laughs> Good to have you here. Uh, any prayer requests or praises? We heard quite a few in the lobby at 9 this morning. Pamela, she should be getting well. She's had COVID, and we pray for her to completely recover. She's a very busy lady in this church. Mm -hmm. And Grace. And Grace. And her lungs. Uh, Grace has a lung ailment. It's difficult for her to breathe, and they do not know exactly uh, what to do with that yet. So guide the doctors that they can come up with a solution sooner than later. I was wondering how Pamela is doing. Is she getting better? I haven't heard a report for a couple of days, but she was on the mending road last we heard. So I think that's what we Did want. Did she have to go to the hospital? No. She had, but she has a mother living with them and they had to confine in the house so that you don't want uh, mom to get this at an elevated age like that. It's very dangerous. And Ruth. And Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Lee, I can get started now here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pray for Lee that he can be on time to church in the future. He was over setting up <laughs> all the chairs for fellowship yes. today. <laughs> Lee's very helpful to everybody. We're glad he's with us. Yes. We have two Lees in the class. And Carol and... Good morning. And Bernie. And Bernie And Carlson. Rosie. And Rosie. Oh. So good, good to Good morning, see you guys. Rosie. Good morning, Rosie. <laughs> and Loretta, we want to pray for you. Rosie. And for yeah, Karen. Wave to you this morning. Hi, Rosie. <laughs> um, I had surgery. Yeah. <laughs> they broke her arm well, here to straighten out. <laughs> they took out three bones. Otherwise, she's... Anyway, you'll hear a bit more about that later. Um, prayer requests or praises. The heat is making our garden grow. Our corn is about that tall. I am attempting to get my driver's license, and it looks to me like God's going to work it all out, but it might take till the end of the year. But Oh, that'd be so I, neat. I can't make the, the ignition interlock work, but I have a friend, and if I can keep that battery running, I don't even have to drive the car. I just have to keep that machine working. <laughs> okay. So maybe by the end of the year, I might that'll have be... that privilege back. Amen. I'm so happy for you. Well, let's have prayer and begin. Our Father in heaven, we have a lot on our mind this morning, and sometimes our praises seem a little muted because you bless us so regularly 
it seems like this is normal, but we know from Earth's history that the peace and joy and comforts we enjoy in this world and the religious freedom we enjoy are transient. They are not normal. That indeed it's your blessings. <clears throat> so we praise you for those everyday blessings. We are so thankful that you have given us a new quarter and a new quarterly that is so real about suffering and so real about the joy of, of uh, following you through whatever paths in life you lead us. We pray for Loretta and the cancer she's battling at this time, and we know that you are the great healer, and we trust you to lead her and to bring her through whatever lays ahead for her. We pray that doctors will do the right thing and that she will be well. We pray for uh, grace in a special way and for the... We, we want a diagnosis. I know what it's like to go when you're ill and they don't know what to do to help and we pray that they'll get a good diagnosis, give her the right treatment and I know that your wisdom can bless those doctors to do the right thing. Pray for Roxy too and give her strength and resolve and healing. We love Fred and Roxy and we are so glad that they are part of our lesson week by week and we just praise you for them. Uh, I know I'm forgetting some others that were mentioned. We are glad for PJ and the progress she has made in her life and her dedication to you and her overcoming of substances and 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 we just pray that you'll help her regain the freedom and the privileges that she has had in the past and and may that just add a little cherry on the Sunday as it were to make it all the worthwhile for her to to hold fast to her resolve and we pray for strength for her and uh, we we just praise you for PJ and what a blessing she is to this church. We pray for a blessing as we go through this lesson that we'll not leave anything important out. It's such a big subject, and we just uh, ask for your wisdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're studying about the crucible. Ruth, what's a crucible? That's a big word. You're asking me or them? You. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. Okay, guys, what's a crucible? It's the whole title of our lesson this quarter. The, in the crucible with Christ. It doesn't say in the crucible without Christ. It says in the crucible with Christ. Well, let's look. Anybody want to take a shot at what a crucible is? All right. Here's a crucible. Fred. Oh, Fred. Thank you, Fred. It's a container where things happen under heat. Under heat, yes. That's right. Well, I looked up quite a few definitions this week of crucible, and the one I liked best was from the Webster's Dictionary. And the first one Fred just got, it's a vessel of very refractory material, such as porcelain, used for melting and calcining a substance that requires a high degree of heat. But it's also a severe test, and it's also a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. I thought it was interesting that Webster put that part in, because that's actually the metaphor of our lesson, that we are put under heat to purify us and to change us. Um, have you seen this quarterly's cover? Who, has, who needs this quarter, the quarterly for this quarter? It's in the lobby. We could have somebody run get some. This uh, graphic on the cover, since 1990, a friend of mine, Lars Justin, has painted these. And on Facebook this morning, he um, explained how he came up with the idea for that graphic through studying what a crucible was and by uh, contemplating 
uh, the lesson. He read through the manuscript way ahead of time because he's developing the graphics ready for printing. And his imagery of Christ in the crucible, it's not the dross on top that paints the picture, it's the light coming through the dross that paints the picture. He wanted to make that very clear because Jesus isn't dross. <laughs> he isn't what needs to be skimmed off the top. He's the light of the world. And we see that light shine through. Um, a lady stood up at church one day and sang the song From a Distance. Have you heard it on the radio? From, the wor- from a distance the world is blue and what? Blue and green with snow-capped mountains white. From a distance. And then it ends with God watches us from a distance. And This lesson flips that whole idea on its head because it is saying that the God of the universe, our creator, the one who we, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, suffered in humanity in a way none of the others of us can. We can experience our own grief and our own suffering, but on the cross, he bore our griefs and he bore our sufferings. Our God is a God that is close and at hand. He's a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. We must always uh, see them. Contrasted against the background of the cross. Our troubles must be always seen on the back. Contrasted against the background of the cross. We must always remember that no matter what anyone faces, Jesus Christ, our creator and redeemer, went through more. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that, from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. We talk about it. You know, we talk about God being omnipresent. He's everywhere about him being omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipotent. He has all power. But do you know, an infinite God can hurt infinitely. And sin has brought such sorrow to the heart of God that we may not fully understand it. I know that for sure. We cannot. What we'll try to show in this is that pain, suffering, and loss does not mean that God has abandoned us. They mean only that even as believers, we share now in the common lot of the fallen race. God is not missing when you're suffering. We are caught up like dust bunnies in a vacuum cleaner. We're just flying around, this history's happening to us, and it's not about us. The great controversy is not about the controversy between us and Satan, or the controversy between you and your wife. The great controversy is between Christ, Christ and Satan. And we're here in the middle, and thank God he is able to make something good out of a bad thing. In fact, this whole thing of Earth's history one day will be wrapped up and what will forever seal sin from the universe is the testimony of the people that lived through it and were saved by grace. Because God's law is love and it is fair. And he does have the right to forgive sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This week, I looked at what the references in the scripture were, and it's Psalms 23. So you may as well get your Bibles out and go to Psalms 23. We're going to be there all through the lesson. And I was wondering, how can you spend a whole week just on the 23rd Psalm? And then I got into it, and I thought, how how are we going to get this done in an hour? (laughs) Because we spend far more than an hour preparing for this. 
And how do we get this down to where we can march through it and make sense of it and dwell on the amazing things that happen in this psalm? And we had several epiphanies as we were studying this. You know, I've been through the 23rd Psalm, I don't know how many times in my life, but yet drilling down on it in this sense, this writer brought out some ideas that really illuminated some facts that just, one particularly brought tears to my eyes to think about what David wrote so many years ago. So before we talk about the shepherd's crucible, so we're mostly focusing on our shepherd Jesus this morning, but I wanted to talk a little bit about sheep. Did you know I spent some time, I mean, I couldn't do much this week, so I spent some time researching sheep. And I learned a whole bunch of interesting things about sheep, but I'm just going to share a few with you. There's over a thousand kinds of sheep. I didn't know that. <laughs> they have a gene, some of them have a gene in them that they can uh, grow two to four to even six horns on their head. And you can see a picture of that. There's the Raqqa sheep, which are in the middle top there. And both the males and females have long spiral shaped horns. And then there's Najdi sheep that have long silky hair rather than curly wool. And I didn't know that either. When sheep bend down to graze, they have a 320 degree peripheral vision. So there's only 40 degrees they can't see. They can see all the way around them when they're grazing, which is important because, you know, they're, they're pretty vulnerable to predators. Um, and this one, I mean, I grew up around sheep, but they don't have any top teeth. They just have a hard palate on the top and sharp teeth on the bottom. So they break off the grass by their top teeth against their hard palate, and then they chew. They are highly sociable. They're not just in a flock for protection. They love interacting with other sheep. They love being around other sheep. But the one that I want to drill down on the most is that they have a strong instinct to follow the sheep in front of them. The, uh, the Google article I read said, when one sheep decides to go somewhere, the rest of the flock usually follows, even if it is not a good decision. For example, sheep will follow each other to slaughter. If one sheep jumps over a cliff, the others are likely to follow. They are very bright, except for in this instance. Sheep may stray from the flock if they sense danger approaching. This can cause them to blindly run away to avoid what is frightening them. Sheep may also stray simply to satisfy their curiosity or because they're not paying attention while they're grazing. Sounds kind of like people, doesn't it? We follow others astray all the time. Isaiah writes, we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way. And so we are sheep. We are God's sheep. And God writes about that in the Bible. David writes about it. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So we're his sheep. And if we're his sheep, we do certain things. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. A stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. So Christ's sheep know how to hear, what to ignore, and whom to follow. Do we always do that? No, I wish we did. But that's what we want to focus on, being that kind of sheep for our shepherd. Somebody, now there's a lot of Psalms 23 out there, so make sure if I ask you to read that you're reading the slip that has the exact reference I'm talking about. Uh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to... I just wanted to say, we used to raise sheep, and if one would find a hole in the woven wire fence, 
They seem, seem to all fall yeah. and get up. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead. And I, once when we were going to market, I had to stand in the back of the truck with the sheep to make sure one didn't lay down. And I think you can relate that to they. I was told that they would trample the other if one laid down. So I think that relates to how we we shepherd each other as well, watching over each other to keep make sure we're all, you know, yeah, up, watching out over upright. each other as well as Christ being our shepherd. Pointing each other to Jesus. Who has Psalms 23, verses 1 and 2? Verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. So this is an observation of who he is and the benefits he brings us. So we're going to go back over benefits in a bit. But... The fact is, since this was written until now, God does not change. I have okay? a, there's a reference if you want me to read it in my Bible of Ellen White. Okay, go ahead. It's on Psalms 23, uh, D8. Is that Desire of Ages? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's titled, Christ the Good Shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and, and, and am now known of mine as the Father knoweth me. Even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, Jesus found access to the minds of his um, hearers by the pathway of their familiar associations. He had life, he, he had lifened the spirit's influence to the cool, refreshing water. He has represented himself as the light, the source of the life and gladness to nature and to man. Know in a beautiful pasture picture Oh, sorry, I lost my place. He represented his relationship to those that believed on him. No pictures was more familiar to his hearers than this. And the Christ's words linked it, linked it forever with himself. Never could the disciple look on the faithful shepherd. They would see themselves in each helpless and dependent flock. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. Isaiah 40, 9, 11. David had sung, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23, 1. And the Holy Spirit, through Ezekiel, had declared, I will set up the shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Ezekiel thirty four twenty three. Christ applied these prophecies to himself, and he showed the contract between him, between his own character and that of the leaders in Israel. Does somebody have James one seventeen? Thank you. Okay, hand the mic down. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. When I was in college, we went to a technical uh, facility in Portland called Tektronics. Tekto Tektronics. They made oscilloscopes, and uh, they're still a big 
tech company, I believe. And they showed a machine that could accurately place a laser dot within a fraction of a thousandth of an inch. And they didn't have the uh, ability to measure that, but they knew what could happen with a shadow. And they took two plates with lines on them and put them offset and shone light through it. And the shadow of the light was amplified. And therefore, they could get more accurate readings, <coughs> more accurate readings from the plates. And I th think that every time I hear about there's no even a shadow of him turning, not even a little tiny indication of his change. So if, if this is true in the Old Testament, is it true in the post-New Testament time? Are we still serving the same God, this Lord, all caps, the, the, the God of Israel, is he still the God that we serve? Is he still able to be this shepherd? The 23rd Psalm takes us on a journey. And I would like you to all look in your own Bibles and um, well, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Let's, let's do this first. Who has Isaiah 40 verse 11? Put it behind your back. There you go. 40 verse 11. Okay, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. Okay, we heard part of that in the reading that uh, Anna shared with us. Ezekiel thirty four twelve and John ten fourteen to sixteen and First Peter two twenty five. So if you have those. In any order. Ezekiel? No. Ezekiel would be great. 34.12. Yes. I would be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered in, the, in that dark and cloudy day. So there's the storm and the sheep were scattered. And he is going to pursue and find those sheep no matter where they're scattered. This is how a shepherd is. And there's other examples of that in the Bible. John 10, 14 to 16. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know my father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. And First Peter 2.25. I have that. Go ahead, Loretta. Once you were like sheep who wandered away. Hold Red. your mic a little. Oh, sorry. Red is not. Once, there you go. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Do you like that, how that ends? The shepherd is, we think of physical health and physical comforts. We want to be happy and healthy. But what does he say he's going to guard? Our souls. It's a salvation matter, primarily. Let's look at Psalms 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So he leads us in the paths. He restores our soul. And I think the, the act of salvation is what thrills me most, most about being involved in the church, my own, and watching the changed lives in those who have been brands plucked from the burning 
They're, they are involved in a life that's self-destructive and, and miserable, and, and you see this change come about that gives them real joy and peace in their life. And it is just thrilling to see that, that happen. And that puts them on a path of righteousness, right? They've been wandering. We, sometimes we oversimplify this thing of they're lost. What's common about being, people that are lost? Think about the woods. They're lost. They don't know where they're coming from. They don't know where they're going. They don't know which way to turn. But here God says, I'm putting you on a path of righteousness. So look at Psalms 23 and read through it and just shout out, don't worry about the mic this time. I'll repeat it. Psalms 23 and go through and let's see the locations that this path might take us past. Green pastures. Calm water. Calm water. Path of righteousness, the valley of, death. the valley of the shadow of death. That's an interesting phrase, the shadow of death. Where else? Anointing. That we're looking for places. Where's that table? In the presence of enemies, there's a location. Okay, and more, more, one more. Yes. <laughs> That's where we want to end up. This path forever. 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 Yes. yes. So we have experiences in our lives that reflect these locations, don't we? We have those green pasture moments, how we want them more often. What was special about being by the lake, the place with still water, is that sheep can't drink from rushing water. It's a dangerous place. And we're going to talk more about the valley of the shadow of death and the presence of enemies, but we all look forward to the house of the Lord. I hope you all got to be part of camp meeting. Uh, and, and what fun it was to hear the King's Heralds singing, lift up the trumpet. <laughs> Something out of my childhood we heard quite often. And we were looking forward to the house of the Lord in camp meeting. The second part of Monday's lesson had a list that I love so much, I made a PowerPoint for you so you could see it. That's the question, but why are these paths called paths of righteousness or right paths? And then they give four reasons. They lead to the right destination, um, the shepherd's home. That's our end result, right? Second, they are the right paths because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Third, they are the right paths because they train us to be the right people, like the shepherd. And fourth, they are the right paths because they give us the right witness. As we become the right people, we give glory to the Lord. They are right or righteous paths, whether the going is easy or hard. So, if he leads us in the paths of righteousness, it requires us to do what? <coughs> to follow. Um, between SJA being where it was and where PCA is now, we rented a facility at the Mukagawa Institute, and we had a couple of years there, two or three, of three. being there. And I was there quite often on Fridays, uh, helping with technical things. And this one Friday, I see Paul Jenks, who's the music teacher, and he's got these second or third graders, and they're all in line, and he's walking around trees and circles, and he's walking over picnic tables, and all the kids are following, and he's just going around, serpentining around posts. I'm like, Paul, isn't this music class? And he says, yeah. I says, what, how's this music? And he says, well, I'm the leader. They have to learn to follow. I thought, how genius, <laughs> right? And I think maybe we need to play follow the leader more often, right? How do we follow in paths of righteousness if we don't know how to follow Jesus in the simple things? How do we know the, the, the music uh, leader, the, the conductor, makes these little gestures with his wand 
and things change. How do we learn those fine movements if we don't know how to do the easy big ones? Um, the devotional I'm reading right now by Max Lucado, A Gentle Thunder, Hearing God Through the Storm. I read this last week, and one of his chapters, he talked about, aren't we glad that Christ didn't call himself the good cowboy? And I just wanted to read you an excerpt from that. The cowboy drives the cow to slaughter. The shepherd leads the sheep to be shorn. The cowboy wants the meat of the cow. The shepherd wants the wool of the sheep. And so they treat their animals differently. The cowboy drives the cattle. The shepherd leads the sheep. A herd has a dozen cowboys. A flock has one shepherd. The cowboy wrestles, brands, herds, and ropes. The shepherd leads, guides, feeds, and anoints. The cowboy knows the name of all the trail hands. The shepherd knows the name of the sheep. The cowboy whoops and hollers at the cows. The shepherd calls each sheep by name. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, the shepherd who knows his sheep by name and lays down his life for them, the shepherd who protects, provides, and possesses his sheep. Jesus writes, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for my sheep. Ephesians 6, 12. We aren't there yet. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to tell you about an experience I had. I had a flock of sheep at one time. Yeah. I was about 30 or 40, I think. And every night I would go and put them in the sheep barn and, and lock them in. And the next morning I would take them out protected them from coyotes or whatever. Yeah. But one night, uh, little Henry was one of the lambs, and he was blind at birth, and he wasn't there. And I looked and looked, and I had a long day already. And I finally gave up. I said, I'll check tomorrow. Well, tomorrow turned out to be another busy day, and I never did find Henry. There was about 20 acres of woods, and uh, there was a stream ran through that property, and uh, the side where the sheep were was very steep at place. And uh, one time, about two months later, I was down in a very steep place, and I found his little body down there. And he had fallen down and couldn't get out. Yeah. And he, I found his little body. Yeah. That's the way the Lord is. You can see how a shepherd cares for a sheep right there. Mm -hmm. All these years later, it still affects him that way. Psalms 23, verse 4. Okay, Lee. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, it doesn't say here that you lead me around the valley of shadow of death. It says, you lead me through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'm not afraid because you are with me. People want their troubles to go away 
when God doesn't promise that, what he promises is that in trouble, he will be with us. So think about the times in your own life when you've passed through the valley of the shadow of death. Scary times. Which Bible verses were precious to you? About 30 years ago, before Brian was born, I went through a time when the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. (laughs) I could get out of my chair and walk to my car at the office and have crushing chest pain and pain down my left arm. I went to a cardiologist. I blew away the treadmill test. They said there was nothing wrong with me. I would break down during supper with my little kids sitting around me thinking, am I going to be here for them? I don't know. I I thought of Grace. Because she doesn't know what's going on with herself. Hang in there. Pray that God will give her answers because I got a call from my doctor one day and says, I think I know what's wrong with you. You have chronic fatigue syndrome. You've got to knock off work for a couple months. Some people never come back from that. I still have symptoms of it. And uh, you, some people are going through more than the shadow of death. They have a diagnosis. And they know, humanly speaking, it isn't going to be better. Right? Mm -hmm. There's only one way out of this, and that's through resurrection. But that is so scary to go through. And we need, I love what Ruth does with some of her, um, she has a book she keeps promises that she's written in. If you'll have a bad day, she'll go back to that. So on the 23rd of um, June, I had surgery on my wrist. Thursday last week. Yeah, and uh, I had broken my wrist several years ago right before COVID struck. It wasn't set correctly, and I've had a lot of pain for the last couple of years. Can't do things usual like I used to do. And so finally, after a lot of hassles with Ellen and I and different doctors, I got the best surgeon, such a blessing, over at University of Washington. And they did the surgery. And they gave me what is known as a nerve block, where they put it in your armpit, and it makes your whole arm numb. And she said that would last all the way while Art drove me home, which sounded good, because I didn't know about bumping on the roads and everything. And We got home, and I thought, oh, this isn't so bad. They kept saying, you'll you'll have quite severe pain at some point. So I thought, oh, this isn't so bad. It's kind of weird, though. I'd touch my hand, and I felt like somebody else's hand with this hand because I couldn't feel myself. And so right before we went to bed that night, I started feeling a little, and I thought, oh, this isn't bad. But I took some of the medication that they prescribed so I could sleep. I told Art, if I have to wake up in the night, it's okay, just sleep. I'll be fine. I'll go out in the living room. I'll read a book. I'll watch a movie. I'll do something to take my mind off the pain. Well, I woke up, and it wasn't just a little pain. It was a lot. And I went out in the living room, and I couldn't read a book, and I couldn't watch a movie because it was so bad. And all I could do was walk around the living room and pray because it hurt, and I couldn't take any more medication yet. And so after that hour was up, I went back and I took the medication. And I was, I told Art the next morning it was like a 12 out of 10. And he kind of chuckled kindly and said, Ruth, it can only be a 10. (laughs) (laughs) But to me, it was a 12. (laughs) And um, I still was not comforted. I was just so upset. And then Art woke up and he put his arms around me and Even though it still hurt, I was comforted. I was restored. My franticness was restored. And so this week, as I was looking at pictures for shepherds, I saw this picture. And I want you to look at the sheep. I I don't know what you think, but to me, the sheep look like it might be in pain. Um, Certainly comforted there. And Jesus is holding that sheep and looking down with tender love. And I just, 
I want you to think about the sheep. It might not be physical pain. It might be emotional pain. But, and, and I can't wait till I get to heaven and Jesus holds me like this. But until then, when you have times like that, think about the verses that give you hope. I just downloaded an app on my phone to learn memory verses, and it's great because it has blurs out and blanks and everything. You can learn those verses. verses. Hide those verses in your heart so when you have terrible times, you can say, I will never leave you or forsake you. Or when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Take those, and in your darkest times, God will bring those to your memory and help you make it through those tough points. Elizabeth Elliot has a quote that I really like, so I put it here. Where does your security lie? Is God your refuge, your hiding place, your stronghold, your shepherd, your counselor, your friend, your redeemer, your savior, your guide? If he is, you don't need to search any further for security. So how did this sheep in the 23rd Psalm end up in the valley of the shadow of death? Did he wander there on his own? Or did the shepherd lead him there? Does it make you look, tr trust God any less if it's the shepherd who led him there? God's will. God's will. That's really hard to take sometimes, but God has a plan and he has something special to do with you and for you. But couldn't you also wander there? You could also wander there. <laughs> Does it make any difference? Is God with you there either way? He is. God will never take you to something that he will not take you through. I like the way you said that. Because I've heard people say, God will not let something happen to you that you can't handle. And that isn't true because we can't handle cookies. I have a real trouble, okay? Uh, <laughs> but what you said puts the power in God's hand because God will not take us someplace that with his help he cannot take us through. So the second part of this, even a head-on collision. And he has a way to get you out of that, even if it's resurrection. The second part of this is your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is actually a cow prod. Uh, Ruth had this, and did you beat cattle with this? Yeah. You, you didn't lay it on them? You know, like. <laughs> it says the rod and the staff, they comfort. I don't think the shepherd was beating his sheep with his rod and his staff. Have you, have you seen a, cow, a, a dog uh, shy away from a broom? You know they've been hit with it. See, the rod and the staff are defensive for the sheep. Because the bear and the wolf is going to see the worst end of this. Not the sheep. And as far as correction goes, you can hook the sheep and direct it. You can... You can nudge it the right direction, but you aren't beating the sheep with it. Go ahead. Do Sarah a mic for him? Go ahead. With the hook, you can also save. Yes. Right, because you can grab the sheep and pull off them the up edge out of, of that places. precipice. Yeah. You can yep. you can get them back. Now it may not feel real good having this hook around your neck, but it's better than falling down the cliff. So we read, "Spare the rod, spoil the child." And so many people have thought that means beat your kids. That's not what it is. The rod of correction is redirection and defense, not violence. Uh, okay. oh. That elicited. Years ago, I also heard someone say that the rod represents God's word. So you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Oh. There's another way of looking at that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is comforting because it's defensive and it's corrective gently, 
Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him all might be saved. He didn't come to beat you up. He came to save you. Why do we think that the shepherd might be willing to risk being misunderstood by permitting us to enter the dark valley? God is misunderstood on this point all the time. Somebody's going through a rough part in their, part in their life and they say, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Yeah. When do you grow the most? Yeah. Psalm, uh, Psalms 23, verse 5. We've got about four minutes for this day. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. So let's take two of the pieces of that. And the one that caught me emotionally yesterday is you prepare the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Did that ever happen to Jesus? Tell me about it. There was a certain Passover. The Last Supper. Jesus knew the whole ministry, the three and a half years, who Judas was and what his role was. But yet he treated Judas with love and respect. In fact, Judas with the other 11 disciples received the gifts of the Spirit when they were sent out as as missionaries. There he was, seated at the table in the presence of his enemies. How do you treat your enemies? Oh, you love them. (laughs) Thank you, Bob. We have to rethink what it means to be in the presence of our enemies. And how about uh, you, the whole idea of you anoint my head with oil? What is that about? There's some obvious ones and some not so obvious ones. What's the oil in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. So we have the promise as God followers and people who believe in Jesus that he will give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And another thing we know in the Bible that the oil was used as a medication. It was used for healing. And the whole idea of God healing us spiritually, the anointing the head, changing the way we think and feel is very important. But for David, what did the oil on the head mean? Think about David's life. When did he receive oil on the head? Who's Samuel? That you said that? I didn't hear. When he was anointed king, he it says here, you anoint my head with oil. We are sons and daughters of God. We are anointed anointed king. Co regents with him. We are elevated, not just the sheep anymore. We are sons and daughters of God. Anointing our head with oil is that idea that we are anointed with the Holy Spirit. We are saved spiritually, and we are made sons and daughters of God. Romans 12, 18 to 21. Do all you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, You'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. One time I was uh, accused of something I didn't do. And I was even called in on the red carpet about it. And it upset me very much because I wasn't that kind of person and I didn't do that kind of thing. 
but the people were so sure about it, and I'm being very general on purpose, the people were so sure about it that they continued this for four, five, six weeks. And it was very hurtful to me, and I talked to Art about it because I always talked to him about everything, and he said, Ruth, just be like Jesus. And uh, one day, one of the people involved in this came to me and said, I do not get it. Why don't you just get mad? That's what they want. They want you to get really mad, and then they'll get over it. And I said, because I want to be like Jesus. Now, the Ruth in me would say, I really want to tell them off. I really want to tell them how they made me feel and how they wrecked, maybe tainted my reputation. But the Christ in me was saying, be still and know I'm God. I'll take care of this. And after that person came and talked to me, she said, well, because you're doing that, I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. And after that, the whole thing kind of blew over. And I thought to myself, thank you, Jesus, for helping me be that way about it. Because what if I had gone and been all mad and in their face, how would I have been representing my Lord? I would have been doing the same thing that they were doing to me. But that's hard to do on our own. It's only with Christ in us that we can approach our enemies when they hurt us that way. It's very important. And after that experience, I wrote this, and this is what I have on the wall in my office. And any time I'm stressed about something somebody's doing to me, I go and read this, and it really helps. The daisies are just there because it's my favorite flower. But the rest, always pray to have eyes that see the best in people, a heart that forgives the worst, a mind that forgets the bad, and a soul that never loses faith in God. And Lamentations, one of my favorite verses, because this is what Jesus does for us every day. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And if God can forgive my sins every day, him living in me can help me to forgive other people when they sin against me. And I love how the lesson brought out that he obscures your enemy's presence by, uh, David writes, that he obscures their enemy's presence by looking instead at what God is doing on his behalf. What can God do to change you when you're being attacked by somebody? How can God work in you to bless your enemies and do good to those who curse you? Very, very important. I love this verse ending with my cup runs over. So here we're going through all of this green pastures, the, the still waters, the valley of the shadow of death, and he ends with my cup runs over. He is so full of gratitude to God, and I hope that you have those moments in your life when you comprehend what God is doing for you and what he has done for you that you just say, I can't take anymore. It's running over. I don't deserve this. And, and I want you to know what we've talked about in our testimony today is glory to God because our cups run over and it's because we have chosen God's way in our family and in our personal lives. And God brings blessings you cannot contain. He will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you can't contain it. And... David himself, with all that he had been through, the king trying to kill him, all this stuff going on in his life, my cup runs over. And he goes on then in verse 6. Surely he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we don't want to shortchange that. But we're so far out of time, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have something we want to share with you. Um, rather than having a normal prayer this morning, we're going to play you a song. And I'd like it to be a prayer. I'd like you to just listen to the words and pray that to God in your heart. And as soon as that's over, we're done with Sabbath school this morning. Thank you. We need sound on PowerPoint.
The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will. my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on His pure delights, and I I will trust in you, and I will trust in you, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will Your goodness will lead.